Hare Krishna. I'll start. Hare Krishna. I'll start with the Mangla Charan. Om Agnyanati Nirandasya Gnyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurul Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam one day, Ham Shri Guru, Shri Yuta Padakamalam, Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Rupam Sagrajatam, Sagana Ragunata Vitam Tam Sajivam, Sadvaitam Savadutam, Parijana Sahitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam. Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Vitamsha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagat Pate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostite Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vishabhanu Sute Devi Pramani Hari Priye Vanchakalpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnave Pyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaurupa Uttavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Krishna Hare Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Danvat Pranam. Please accept our humble obeisances on behalf of everybody in this group who have joined and are about to join Prabhuji. Prabhuji, we are reading the Srimad Bhagavatam and we are on Canto 1, Chapter 4. Chapter 4, Prabhuji, is the appearance of Sri Narada and today we are on Text 14. Prabhuji, should we hand over to you or would you like us to read the text, translation and purport? Yes. Avinash Prabhu with Tirith Prabhu would like to read. Yes. I, I think um, uh, Prahlad, Prahlad Prabhu, are you in a position to Hare read? Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Prahlad Prabhu, is it um, possible for you to read the translation? I'm not quite prepared, Mataji. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Avinash Prabhuji, uh, do you have the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam with you? Sorry, I've just joined here, so let me remind me where we are. Prabhuji, we are on Canto 1, Chapter 4, Text 14. Text 14. Yes, Prabhuji. So we are reading the, uh, yes, the text as well? Yes, Prabhuji, if you can read the Sanskrit so that we can also learn how to pronounce. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> I'll try here. Okay, hurry, Wolf. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, um, Canto 1, text 4, uh, chapter 4, text 14. Sutta Uvacha. Dvapare samanu prapte. Dvapare samanu prapte. Tritye yuga paryaye. Tritye yuga paryaye. Chataha parashara yogi. Chataha parashara yogi. Vasvyam kalaya hare. Vasvyam kalaya hare. Okay, so are we reading word to word? Yes, Prabhuji. We can repeat after you. Chataha. Sutta Goswami. Sutta Goswami. Uvacha. Uvacha. Said. Said. 
द्वापरे द्वापरे इन द सेकंड मिलेनियम इन द सेकंड मिलेनियम समानु प्राप्ते समानु प्राप्ते ऑन द एविडेंट ऑफ ऑन द एडवेंट ऑफ ऑन द सॉरी सॉरी आई एम शो सॉरी ऑन द एडवेंट ऑफ तृतीय तृतीय थर्ड थर्ड युगा मिलेनियम मिलेनियम पर्यये पर्यये इन द प्लेस ऑफ इन द प्लेस ऑफ चतह चतह वाज बिगोटन वाज बिगोटन पराशरत पराशरत बाय परासरा बाय परासरा बाय परासरन योगी Yogi, the great sage the great sage vasvyam vasvyam in the womb of the daughter of vasu in the womb of daughter of vasu kalaya kala kalaya in the plenary portion in the plenary portion hare hare of the personality of godhead of the personality of god hare okay. krishna thank you very much prabhu ji thank for you for reading the text and the word to word kalat prabhu you are ready now yes mata ji translation on purpose uh the purpose yes translation first prabhu and then the okay. translation uh sutika swami said when the second millennium overlapped the third the great sage vyasadeva was born to parasa in the words of satyavati the daughter of vasu purport by his divine grace ac bhakti vedanta swami shila propad shila propad ki yeah yeah there, there is a chronological order of the four millenniums namely satya dwapara treta and kali but sometimes there is overlapping during the regime of vaivasta manu there was an overlapping of the 20th round of the four millenniums and the third millennium appeared prior to the second in that particular millennium lord shri krishna also descends and because of this there was some particular alteration the mother of the great sage was satyavati the daughter of the vas the vasu fisherman and the father was the great parasa muni that is the history of vyasadeva's birth every millennium is divided into three periods and each period is called a sandhya vyasadeva appeared in the third sandhya of that particular age hare krishna Hare Krishna thank you very much Prahlad Prabhu for reading the translation and perfect Hare Krishna Prabhu ji we hand over to you now Hare Krishna Thank you Prabhu Acharya Pankaj Nandi Te Guru Mayat Kripa Tumhe Vande Shri Guru Mukti Taran so thank you Mataji thank you everyone um for this opportunity apologies um obviously this is an end minute sort of change between Kunchabdra Prabhu and myself but i pray that with everyone's blessings we can actually turn the shuma bhagavatam together and i do apologize my health is a bit um not is not great so you may find that i'm like sniffing and so on and so forth so please accept my apologies but uh, yeah hopefully we can chant something together <clears throat> so just to uh, read the translation again so the goswami said when the second millennium overlapped the third the great sage vyasadev was born to parashar in the womb of satyavati the daughter of vasu so before we get into the verse itself there's an interesting point that i heard from krishna chetra maharaj very recently around how this verse itself is a is another beginning within the shrimad bhagavatam and we see in shrimad bhagavatam it's full of many new beginnings there's many conversations that take place conversations inside conversations inside conversations inside conversations you know um it all starts with sat goswami in the say in and the sages and then you know so so many different 
embedded conversations. And at the same time, we see Srimad Bhagavatam functions as if it's a sequel to the Mahabharata, you know. So the Mahabharata was taking place, Berkshire Maharaj is now a descendant from the Pandavas, and now he's on the verge of, you know, seven days to live. What's he going to do? When we think of sequels in modern sort of terminology, especially movies, we think, oh, you know, parents, and now the children's going to have their own little adventures, you know, there's, there's going to be new actors, new actresses, a new plot, and so on and so forth. But actually, when we look at the Shrimad Bhagavatam, we can appreciate the authenticity and the value of Krishna Katha. Because what we see is that it's not, you know, there were the old, there, there were Pariksha Maharaj's parents and grandparents, etc. And their sort of movie, if we, like, if we use that word, was Mahabharat. And now it's Shrimad Bhagavatam. No, because Shrimad Bhagavatam is actually a conversation of Pariksha Maharaj based on the life of his predecessors. And we can see that Shrimad Bhagavatam, unlike even movies, modern day movies, it's always ever fresh. It's told, it's retold, and it's retold again and again through different conversations, but we relish it so much. Every time we read it, we find something, oh my God, you know, that was something new. I didn't think about that before. I didn't see that before. But it's not that scriptures have changed. What's changed is our own situation. The Bhagavatam is living and with, when our situation changes, we can appreciate the Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, the scriptures in different ways. So when we look at this verse, the verse actually itself starts to take us on a new beginning of, in fact, the beginning of Mahabharata from before Bhishma Dev is even born. So before the Mahabharata, we already know about the personality of Bhishma Dev. And this is now taking us to a time from even before Bhishma Dev's advent to the birth of Vyasadev. In the purport, Sri Prabhupada starts by talking about the chronological order of the four millennials, right? So Satya or Krita Yug, Dvapar Yug, Trita Yug, and Kali Yug. Oftentimes, um, I think most of us are probably listening to different, different classes. And when we hear of the four Yugas, we hear it in the order of Satya, Trita, Dvapar, and Kali. But here, Sri Prabhupada's telling us actually that Satya Yug comes first, then it's usually Dvarpa Yug, and then Tritha Yug, and then Kali Yug. And yet, in our specific case, as Sri Prabhupada also mentions, due to a special circumstance, we have Satya, then Tritha, then Dvarpa, then Kali. That's, that's interesting. But then Sri Prabhupada also tells us that it's because Lord Sri Krishna also descends, and because of this, there was some particular alteration. So it's actually Krishna's appearance, you know, in one way we can see as Krishna's appearance, that is the cause of there being a special sort of alteration to the usual cycle. But then, okay, the question is, well, time is linear, you know, now is different to tomorrow, you know, tomorrow is different to yesterday. What I said five seconds ago remains five seconds ago. It doesn't come back around again, and it doesn't become the future of what I just said. So how do we understand this? So um, I, I could do a scientific thing. Um, so I'll touch on it a bit, but I'll make it relevant. <laughs> um, so when we look at astronomy, there's actually something, uh, it, it's like an apparent um, pl pl planet a retrograde motion, right? And what that means is that, so as we know, we, the earth rotates around the sun and it also has its own orbit and so, so on and so forth. But so do the other planets. But the other planets don't follow the same cycle that we do, right? They're not on the same path that we have. And so sometimes from our perspective, from the Earth's perspective, we'll see other planets going backwards sometimes. The way we can understand that is if we're on the motorway, motorway or highway, I don't know which word you use in Eldra, but in the UK, we have three lanes usually, right? There's a slow lane on the left, and then the fastest lane is on the right motorway highway speed, so 70 miles per hour, something like that. Now, let's say you're going in the fast lane at 70 miles per hour, and there's a car next to you going at 50 miles per hour. If you were to directly look to your side, to the side of the car, whilst you're passing, you know, whoever's driving is driving at 70, the other car's driving at 50. 
to your from from your vision you see that actually that car is going backwards because even though they're going at 50 miles forwards because you're going faster at a certain point in time they're appearing to look go backwards so the same case is here with the different yugas right it's not that they you know it's not that suddenly there's a change and you know the cars have swapped places or something like that actually all it is is the cyclical nature of time so from a modern science perspective we see time being linear but from a vedic calculation time is cyclical the yugas the maha yugas rotate around everything rotates around and as part of that ro rotation as part of that cycle we also see that sometimes different yugas will appear at different times as well there's an overlap as, as we see in this in this um, verse when the second millennium overlapped the third so in this case, uh, we see that in, in our current millennium, we see that Dhritta appears before Dwarva. And that is for Krishna's advent to then lead on to the Kali Yuga, to lead on to the Srimad Bhagavatam and the literature is actually being compiled. So that's one aspect of the purple. And before we get into the middle section around the birth of Vyasadeva, I'll quickly jump to the last section as well, because it's quite related. The last line, just reading it again. Every millennium is divided into three periods, and each period is called a Sandhya. Vyasadeva appeared in the third Sandhya of that particular age. So what is Sandhya? Right. Oftentimes we do hear the Sandhya God or something like that. So if you break it out, then sun is like um, auspicious or good. And then Dhya, Dhya, you could take the word Dhya and it, it, it's part of the word of Dhyan. Right? So dhyan meaning like meditation. And then kal meaning time. So if we if we look at the verse, it's, uh, the phrase itself, sandhya kal, is the auspicious time to perform meditation. Right? Now, we see that there's three sandhyas, right? Three periods. Each period is called a sandhya. So how, how do we see this? So we can see this in, if we just take the daytime, as one aspect of Sandhya, we can see that there's sunrise, there's noon, and there's sunset. Or more accurately, it's the twilight related to sunrise, the, the noon, and then the twilight related to sunset. So the, the specific times of the twilight, which is when different parts of the day, we transition from one part of the day to another, that's really the Sandhya time, the Sandhya Kal. So we see in, even in Krishna consciousness in ISKCON, we see that the best time to chant, we, we always say is during the monk, just before Mongol, right? Around that time period, because that's the Sandhya, the Sandhya Kal for the morning. Similarly, if you see um, those who are second initiated, Brahman, Brahman initiated, when they chant the Dagaitri Mantra, they're told to chant three times, right? Usually, ideally, it would be around sunrise, around noon, around sunset. So we can see that even within our own ISKCON, this Krishna conscious culture, the cultivation of culture, the idea of the three auspicious times is very prevalent and present. And actually with this whole idea of Sandhya, we see in various points of the Shrimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavatam as well. In Canto 11, chapter 27, verse 11, it's mentioned, fixing the mind on me, one should worship me by his various prescribed duties, such as chanting the Gayatri Mantra at the three junctures of the day. Such performances are enjoyed by the Vedas and purify the worshipper of reactions to fruitive activities. In the Sanskrit, in the first line, it's actually Sandhyo Pasya Di Karmani. Sandhyo, Sandhyo. And the way Sri Prabhupada has translated that as Sandhya is at the three junctures of the day, dawn, noon, and sunset. So that's where the Gayatri aspect comes up, comes from. Okay, so that's the daytime. How can we see Sandhya in other sort of factors of life? If we see anything in life is actually breaking out, breaking out into three different principles, three different regions of existence. We can take the universe. There's the creation aspect and, and that whole section. Then there's the existence, and then there's the dissolution, right? When it's become, become destructed. 
or if we look at the body, there's the birth and the youth, then there's the middle age. And, and we know even from like many of us who have studied even a bit of biology or who are a lot more senior in age, you know that there's a certain time that you reach a peak in your, you know, your body, your youth, you feel like, you, you know, like I'm at my prime time in, in, in my days. And then after that, you just start to dip and then eventually you reach old age and death. So you see, there's the three prominent sandhyas there as well. And then one other sort of thing to kind of touch on is Mangalarti. We have our Samsara Dava Nalili Loka Prez. In the last stanza, we have Yasya Prasada Bhagavat Prasado, Yasya Prasada Nagati, Nagati Kutopi, Dhyayam Sduvam Tasya Yasas Tri Sandhyam, Vande Guru Shi Charanaravindam. And here, in that translation, three sandhyam is more referring to three times a day, we should be offering our respectful obeisances to our spiritual master. Right. So this is one first teaching that we can take from this whole sandhya aspect, right? Just from the, just from the phrase of sandhya that Sri Prabhupada used in the purple. If we link it back to the various different um, understandings that we have of the word, and specifically I'm looking at this verse from the Mangalarti, how many of us actually pay obeisances to our spiritual master three times a day? You know, how many of us, you know, when we go to the temple, we'll pay our obeisances to Sri Prabhupada, to the deities. <clears throat> Maybe at home when we're doing the arti in the morning, we'll pay obeisances. But oftentimes, you know, a lot of us, because of life, etc., we find it difficult to perform more than one arti in the day. But oftentimes we will come to the deities, we will pass the deities, you know, oftentimes they'll be in the living room or something like that. But we just pass by them oftentimes, you know, like Hare Krishna, you know, we didn't recognize that they're there, but we just pass by them. We don't actually take, take five seconds to pay our obeisances. You know, that's one thing that we can learn just based off of the last stanza with the three, three sandhyam aspect. Um, so, so with the spiritual master as well, we see, bringing it slight, slightly back to the verse as well, there's Vyas Puja as well, right? Now we understand Vyas. Vyas there is referencing Vyasadev, right? Why is that? Because Vyasadev, okay, yes, our Parampara starts with Brahma, but Vyasadev is our, our main spiritual master in, in one sense. Because of Vyasadev, we have the written forms of Shrima Bhagavatam of all the Vedic literatures. So in some way, we are actually paying our respects to Srila Vyasadeva as well when we're performing Vyasa Puja. And uh, Bhakti Santa Saraswati Thakur actually gave a lecture on the Srimad Bhagavatam at some point, where he defined Vyasa Puja means the puja of all Gaudiya Vaishnava Acharyas. So oftentimes, I mean, I, I definitely speak for myself, when I'm going to the temple or whatever it is, if, I, if I'm just celebrating from home or something. Shri Prabhupada's Vyas Puja, Spiritual Master's Vyas Puja, Bhakti Santa Saraswati Thakur's Vyas Puja. The focus is purely on the personality. But here, what Bhakti Santa Saraswati Thakur is telling us is that Vyas Puja is actually meant for all Gaudiya Vaishnava Acharyas. It's an opportunity for us to, yes, definitely appreciate the personality that we're celebrating from that day, but it's Vyasa Puja. It's actually meant to be a celebration for all the Acharyas. So when we're celebrating the Vyas Puja of Shri Prabhupada, whoever it is, yes, when we're writing the offerings to Shri Prabhupada, we can always think, at least mentally, okay, yes, you know, we can always appreciate all the Acharyas, what they've given us. Prabhupada is an Acharya, but he became an Acharya, he, he gave us so much because of his faith, his determination, his trust, and his chastity to his predecessing Acharya, and so on and so forth. So when we're celebrating the Vyas Puja of Sri Prabhupada, our spiritual master, we can always please them even more by referencing the whole Gaudivation of Acharya, the whole disciplic succession. We can appreciate every personality in the, in the, in the Parampara, and actually, if we see it one way, that's what would please them as well. Because in their heart, they know that what they've gotten is because of their guru, of their predecessing acharyas. 
Um, one thing that uh, comes up a lot with um, a Bhakti Riksha group that I'm in as well, that, that we run in the UK, is that oftentimes we want to appreciate the personality who's leading the Kusango, so on and so forth. And, you know, we, we always get taught, especially those who are preaching that, you know, you should be humble, accept the, the praise, but pass it on, you know, like you didn't get anything, you pass it on. But these personalities aren't being humble for the, you know, by namesake, you know, when I'm being humble, I'm saying, okay, you know, like, praise me more, praise me more, but, you know, our lip service, I'll give it back to the gurus. But these personalities actually mean it when they're saying, actually, you know what, I'm nothing. Without my guru, I'm actually nothing. It's because of them that I'm able to give you this. And in fact, I'm not giving you anything. I'm just presenting what my guru has given. I'm just serving him by sharing it with you. So the question we can ask is, when our charas, when Shri Prabhupada, everyone has done so much to propagate the movement, to push on the, the vani from their spiritual masters, what can we do? What are we doing? What battles are we fighting to please them? What sacrifices are we making to please them, right? To propagate the movement and to push it forward. Because if we see our whole disciplic chain, they all had the opportunity to just, I mean, Sri Prabhupada was in Vrindavan, right? He had the perfect opportunity to just live life selfishly and just practice his own Krishna consciousness, go back and back to Godhead. But he took the anxiety to come to the West, to travel the world multiple times, to stand up so many temples, to translate so many books. Why? Because he understood the mood is to propagate the movement, to push Krishna consciousness forward, not just for the sake of pushing it forward, but to bring others to Krishna, have that compassion and that merciful mood. So we can ask ourselves, what are we doing to help push forward, you know? Whatever service, it doesn't have to be preaching, but are we doing something that we can say, yes, you know, if Shri Prabhupada stood in front of me today, I could say, I am doing this service for you, Prabhupada. Are you pleased? So that comes from Vyas Puja, right? That whole conversation. So we can bring it back to Vyasadev and his whole appearance, right? How, how did he actually come? So. In the purport, Sri Prabhupada <coughs> mentions a couple of other personalities. So there's Satyavati, Vasu, and Parashara Muni. So I'll talk about Parashara Muni first. So it's described that he's actually a very great sage. And in the trans in the purport, Sri Prabhupada uses just the word great Parashara Muni. But in other other, other verses, it is he is referenced as a great sage. And in fact, when we hear of the six opulences of God, of Krishna, you know, wealth, full of wealth, full of strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, renunciation. Where, do, where, where does this come from? This actually comes from Brasher, right? He's the one that has given that. And yeah, that, that's just one, one part of his sort of greatness as a sage, what he's given us. He's, he's great, he's powerful. He's a self-realized sage. And then if we look at Satyavati, right, who is Vyasadeva's mother, it's described in this purport that she's actually the daughter of a fisherman, Vasu. There are different sort of versions of her heritage. Uh, the most common one that I've heard actually is that um, Vasu was not a fisherman um, necessarily, but was a king who, uh, long story short, there's he he's away from home on expedition and he has to stay the night away but he's thinking about his wife the queen and in that process he releases semen now in those days you know i mean even now semen is very valuable and so what he did was that he um, contained the semen and he sent a bird to go and deliver it to his wife so that she gets impregnated etc cetera, etc cetera. but on the way the bird gets attacked by another bird and then the pot basically falls in the water and a fish gets impregnated, basically. And so Satyavati is actually the daughter of the fish from the semen of a king. 
and um, I, I don't fully remember, nor do I know the middle sort of thing, what happened, but she ends up being either adopted or something like that from a fisherman. And this fisherman's job is actually, actually to help passengers cross the river, right? So that's one of the services or jobs that the fisherman does. And Satyavati being the daughter of a fisherman sometimes goes with him. But it's described that Satyavati, because of her birth, the way she was born and the place that she lives in, you know, she's a fisherman's daughter. So I don't know if, you, if you've ever been to like fish markets or anything like that, where they are very, very smelly to the extent that even those who eat fish don't like to go to the fish market or stay there for too long. That's how odorous it is in a bad sense, right? And Satyavati is, I mean, full of this odor, right? Pungent in, in, in one way. So many, many people don't like to go when Satyavati is there because they're like, oh, you know, like it smells, et cetera, et cetera. And okay, so that's, you know, so the, the three personalities basically, Vasu, Parashramuni. So Parashramuni, a great sage, self-realized soul. Then Satyavati, who is a daughter, okay, she's, you know, probably, well, she's a young maiden. And from the description, she's, she smells very badly. Now, even in modern days, like if we see somebody who's quote unquote materially ugly, et cetera, et cetera, nobody's really attracted to them, right? But oftentimes it is described that Parashur, and this is one version that Parashur was attracted to Satyavati and therefore he wanted to uh, engage in physical relationships with her. But the what I've, at least I've understood to be more Shastakri correct is a different version which is that him being, Parashramuni being a great sage, he was an expert at astrology. We can see even now in our lineage, like Shabrupad and especially Bhakti Santa Sarasthi Thakur, he was a great astrologer, but he didn't really emphasize on it so much because it wasn't so important. Krishna consciousness was more important for him and rightly so. But so it is described that Brasha actually saw constellations. He saw the position of the stars. He saw, you know, how all the different um, planetary systems, the stars, everything was in place in the, in the sky. And he could see that a great personality is going to be born from this star formation. And with some analysis, with some deduction, he, he understood, okay, you know, a great personality needs to be born, but I need help. Now, in order for somebody to give birth to a child, there needs to be the male and the female, right? The only person that was with Brahmani at the time, because he was crossing the, the river, was Satyavati. So he had requested her, like, you know, a, a great personality is going to be born. Would you like to be the carrier of this personality? Now, Satyavati was a very sort of chaste little person. She was ashamed, actually, because one is that she smelled, you know? How could she let such a great sage unite with her when she's, you know, a low, a low birth nobody in, a, in one sense? And the second thing was that she'd break her virginity, you know, a physical union would need to take place when she's not even married. But Brasher actually benedicted her with two things off the back of this. One is that should be so fragrant, should be sh should smell so sweetly for your genes, it's described, which is for miles. So much so that she actually became known as Yojana Gandhi afterwards. And the second thing that she benedicted, he, she was benedicted with, is that she'd still keep her virginity, right? And we see this in various other places as well within the Bhagavatam. So in the end, Satyavati agreed to the union. And so they went on, went to an island, Brahmani with his mystic powers, he created a um, mist, so, so to speak, so nobody could see what was happening. And they had physical union from which Vyasadeva was born. And we can see that, you know, Brahmani's constellation prediction understanding was perfect because who is Vyasadeva? He's the Satyavesh avatar, the, the empowered incarnation of the Supreme Lord. And it's described that actually Vyasadev um, is an interesting character. Immediately as, when he was born, he became 12 years old and left home. 
but before leaving home, he 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 had told his mum is to told Satyavati that if she needs him, then she can call out to him and he'd return. So this Satyavati, um, for those who are familiar with Mahabharata to some degree, is the same Satyavati who then marries Bhishma Dev's father. Right. Um, we probably will have time, um, so I might talk about that a bit later. But uh, yeah, so Bhishma Dev's father, backstory there is that uh, Bhishma Dev's born from Mother Ganga and um, his father wants to, gets attracted to Satyavati after she's now fragrant, etc., and wants to marry her. Bhishma Dev sees this and because there's a lot of turmoil sort of between Satyavati's fa fisherman father and Bhishma Dev's father around the marriage proposal, Bhishma Dev promises that he will live a brahmachari lifestyle. He will never get married, he will never have children, such that Satyavati's children could heir the throne. And in return for this, Bhishma Dev's father gives him the benediction of Ichamrityu, which means that he can die at any moment when he chooses. So the moment he chooses to die, he can die. That's a, a, an absolutely great benediction for those who are Krishna conscious, by the way, because when you're listening to Krishna Katha, when you're speaking Krishna Katha, you could go, I want to die now. And, you know, you're guaranteed to go back home, back to Godhead. You, um, you have to think about, oh, you know, like whilst I'm driving, I see an advert on the on the street, like a billboard and I'm reading it. And what if I have an accident in the past? I know, you know, you just choose whilst I'm on a Zoom call, listening to Krishna Katha, I'll just pass away. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, that, that's, that's one Mahabharata aspect to Satyavati. And the other is also that we see that in, um, in the Mahabharata that Pandu, Dhritarashtra and Vidura, they're actually step brothers. And the backstory is that Satyavati is the one that instigated Vyasadev to beget children, to heir the throne. And so from one, one queen came Dhritarashtra, and backstory is so Vyasadev, Vyasadev, because he's self-realized, he's completely renounced in one way. He's not a sannyasi, but he's renounced from, from standard lifestyles. So he kept himself as a very, um, in, in a very simplistic times without disrespect, but in a very ugly sort of form. He'd not shower, etc. His hair would be very um, messed, like, uh, it's like, what's it called, matted hair or something like that. It's like very messy. And he'd, he'd generally look very ugly to those with materialistic vision. And when he was called in to actually beget these children so that they could take the throne, he wanted to actually spend time to, you know, prepare himself so that he looked attractive, et cetera, et cetera. But Satyavati forced him to actually know, you know, we need an heir now because there was an urgent situation. The kingdom was without a king. And in doing so, Vyasadeva was like, okay, fine. But my condition is that they, whoever he's engaging in physical relationships with, they accept him and they appreciate him properly. So the first person, Ambika, um, so physical union with Ambika and Ambika was so scared that she closed her eyes during the union. And thus Dhritarashtra was born, who was blind. Second one, Ambika, she turned pale and thus Bandu was born, who was also pale. And the third time, it was meant to be Ambika, uh, sorry, not Ambika, um, Ambalika that went, right, the third time. But Ambalika had actually cheated Vyasadev based off the fact that she didn't want to unite with him again. And instead, in her place, she sent a servant, a maid servant. But the servant was absolutely relaxed. She fully appreciated Vyasadev. And thus, Vidura was born, who was perfect. He's actually um, the wisest of the three as well. So that's a bit of Vyasadev's birth and a bit of the pastimes of him with his mother. 
but what can we learn? You know, like it's it's nice that these are just pastimes. Now I've kind of, to be honest, because of my lack of preparation, I've just jumped from one pastime to another kind of thing. But what can we learn from the pastime of Vyasadev's birth? You know, what's what's actually in it for our growth other than just the nectar that we're hearing around, you know, it's Krishna Katha. For me, there's two things that we can really take away. One is Vyasadev, right? Who is he? He's a Satyavesh avatar born in the womb of a low birth fisher woman, right? Now, when we think of great people, great personalities, we often think, oh, you know, they have a great lineage, they, have, they come from great parenthood. Even you can see um, Krishna or the Pandus, etc. they come from a great lineage. But here's Vyasadev, who's, who's a Satyavish, an empowered incarnation of Krishna. And he takes the birth from a fisherwoman. We can also see Haridas Thakur from period of that time. He was born in a Muslim family, which is considered very low, low caste from a Hindu cultural sort of perspective. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made him the Namacharya. So we can see that there's a there's a common theme here, and Vyasadeva is one of the primes whereby it clearly shows that the qualification of great personalities isn't that they're born in great births. The qualification is that they are qualified. Birth actually has nothing to do with it. And the second thing is the nature of Satyavati, right? If we go back to the story of how Vyasadeva was born, we see that Satyavati, off the back of that, she became very renowned. Of course, there's these other pastimes as well. But of her service attitude, she became a great personality. She received benedictions from Brahsha Muni, right? What were those benedictions? She became very, very fragrant. But actually, there's a second one. And that's the fact that she was given the opportunity and she took the opportunity to become the mother of a great personality, of an incarnation of Godhead. But there's two aspects to her service attitude, actually. One is, is her humble service, right? You can see that in the, in the form of her being a fisherwoman. You know, she, she continued on with that service. She would, she's been getting, like, defamed. She's been getting called all these things, her names, etc. People looked at her with disgust. You know, she smelled so badly. But she continued on with her service. She continued on with her livelihood, negating all of that. And the second thing is that, uh, and I hear this term from, other, from another devotee, she turned on, sorry, she took on the embarrassing service. What's the embarrassing service? Without being married, she's begetting a child. She was having an intimate, quote unquote, intimate relationship, a physical relationship with somebody before she's married. Chastity throughout the Bhagavatam is a very big thing in all the female personalities that we see. But she still took that service on. And that's why the term this devotee uses is embarrassing service. What can we learn from this? We can learn to take embarrassing services on. Now, when I'm saying embarrassing services for us, I'm not saying we take on services of impregnating people, you know, so and so forth. Because this was Prasha Muni, right? He was a great sage. He was a, he was a self-realized soul. At least I speak for myself. I'm not a self-realized soul. I'm not at, at a stage where I am begetting a child purely because the constellations are right for a great personality to be born. What embarrassing services can we take then? If we all look at our Krishna conscious journey, anything which presents our Krishna consciousness in the eyes of public becomes a place for embarrassment. Japa on the train, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, you know? Or more explicitly in terms of public service, things like book distribution or Hari Nam or Sankirtan, things that often we get very like touchy on, oh, I don't feel comfortable with this, I don't know if I want to go out. I don't want, what, I, what if I meet my relative, you know, like they don't know that I'm practicing this, what if they see this? Or just the general public. But, but we can see that 
Satyavati, um, Satyavati took on those that service, right? She took on the difficulties that would have come with it. And we also should learn to take on the difficulties of these sorts of services. It's not that we just throw ourselves in the deep end, right, necessarily. I mean, if you're, if, if you're somebody who loves thrills, 100% do that, you know? But you could start slowly, right? Something that we, we're doing within School of Bhakti in the UK is that every, every week we have a Harinam party whereby for those who are new, their goal is to just touch the pavement. Just get out of the house, go to where the party is and just touch the pavement with their foot. That's all they do. And then they come back and that's a successful day of Harinam for them. Or some good thing. <clears throat> then the next time, you know, they'll, they'll actually join in with the party and then they'll distribute books and then et cetera, et cetera. So we can take baby steps, small steps. Or if we're down for the challenge, then we can go all out. We can go, okay, let's face the fear head on and completely go all out on distributing the mercy, distributing the compassion. So we should actually learn, and this, this is what really pleases Krishna. When we take anxiety on for Krishna, Krishna sees that, right? When, when he sees that we're not holding back because we're concerned about our name, fame, glory. We're not concerned about our, our physical appearance in terms of our public appearance or anything like that, or position. You know, some people on this call are probably like managers or CEOs or something like that, or companies. You know, I can't go out on the street and, you know, look like a devotee holding, giving books out. Like, what would my people on my work think? You know, Krishna will appreciate the fact that you're seeing beyond your material positions. And in that way, you know, when we take those anxieties on for Krishna, when Krishna sees these, he actually opens our path up to make spiritual progress, rapid spiritual progress, so that we can go back home, back to Godhead, back to him. So I'll end there. Uh, are there any comments, questions? Hare Krishna, Prabhuji, thank you very much for this excellent class. Um, uh, I'm sorry to ambush you today. Uh, you're not well and still you, um, we really appreciate your time and you uh, had only five hours of uh, notice that you had to give this class. So I really apologize for that. And in spite of your not being well, you have, you took up this service. So we really appreciate. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. It's, I it's actually this... purifying, Mataji. So it's good. You know, because one thing I'll mention is that we can very easily use our health as an excuse as well. Yeah, I know we talked about health before, but I'm not talking about that as well. But oftentimes we can use our health as an excuse to do service. So yeah, I used to always have a stomach ache on Monday when I was a kid. <laughs> so <laughs> mine goes way back. Okay. So uh, are there any uh, questions or comments? Maybe I can start with the questions uh, um, if and people can then uh, join in. So Prabhuji, my, uh, I have a few questions. The first one is about the Kalad. So Sat, uh, Satya, Treta, Dwapar, and Kaliuk. Is it just this time it was um, uh, Treta first? or Because it's cyclic, so it is, um, it's been happening. So after this uh, cycle, there'll be again Satyug. So in that, will it be Treta Yug or Dwapar Yug first? Yeah, so my understanding, and I've been trying to reach out to a few senior devotees to get a more Shastra, like get the references from Shastra around it. But my understanding is that Krishna appears in, in only one day of Brahma, right? Once, sorry, he appears once in one day of Brahma, Brahma. And with that, when Krishna appears, that's when the cycle goes Satya, Trita, Dwarpa, Kali. So in the rest of... Brahma's days, it's always the same format. So Satya, Dwarpa, Trita, Kali. But it's only when Krishna appears in his original form that it's in this way, this format. That's not to say that Krishna doesn't appear in the other Mahayugas, but from what I've read around this, right, and apologies, I, I can't give you references for it, um, is that Krishna, even though Krishna and Ram both appear in other Yugas, it's not the original Krishna and original Ram forms. 
So it's more of the in incarnations of them as opposed to the original personality of Godhead. Thank you, Prabhuji. Um, are there any other questions? Then maybe I can ask a second question, Prabhuji. So uh, when you said paying obeisances uh, to your deities as you pass uh, by, and uh, definitely, at least I am guilty, I don't um, pay obeisances um, uh, three times in a day. Uh, but um, uh, I have a neighbor who's a Somali, and today I was observing that they never, 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 never miss out on, I mean, the way they pray and they... Uh, do uh, make their obeisances is similar to ours as well. And I mean, mo so much so that even in airports, they have a prayer room. So I think their dedication is uh, really something to be learned from or appreciated because uh, I was just thinking and looking at him that God, please give me this dedication. I know he's not Krishna conscious, but he himself is teaching me. So I think, uh, thank you, Prabhuji, for reminding me that again, because today this was my thought as well. And uh, any more comments or questions? I just want to add to that, Matthew, quickly. Um, it's, it's actually a very interesting point you made. And uh, yeah, I didn't think about this myself. Like if we look at Muslims who are sincere practice practitioners, I, I record when I was a kid um, we had like two or three muslim families in our local neighborhood and they would actually get out of the car like they might be traveling somewhere but they'd get out of the car when it's time for their prayers mm -hmm. you know? we don't have that rigidity in christian consciousness but yet we don't pay our obeisances oftentimes you know sometimes and i'm very guilty of this is that i might have some services at the temple like a meeting or something like that i'll go if i get five minutes i'll be like okay i'll go take darshan I was oftentimes I will be in and out without even taking darshan sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, something mm -hmm. I need to improve on. But yeah. yeah. And the second thing, um, I'm just going to call this out. Uh, I, I didn't notice we had the Sandhya Mataji on the call as well. It would have been uh, nice for Sandhya Mataji to explain her, her name. <laughs> yeah, and she joined in just when you were explaining about Sandhya. So she might have even <laughs> thought that we are talking about her, but uh, Sandhya Mataji, it was the Sandhya, I, I'm sure you figured it out. No, Kirtika Mataji, I don't ever think anyone talks about me, I'm not that special. <laughs> yes, Prabhuji, I know my name just means dusk. And so, uh, actually, my mom was going to call me Chaya before she decided to give me the name um, Sandhya, uh, and I just know it's dusk. So, my sisters call me Dusky when they want to annoy me, but... Um, other than nothing auspicious about me, Prabhuji, but I thought the class was brilliant. Um, and if I have your permission, uh, Prabhuji, I just want to ask, why was Bhagavatam considered to be a postgraduate book as compared to Gita? Because I was telling my mom about Bhagavatam uh, and I was saying Bhagavatam is like lots of stories. It's quite nice. Um, and actually, while you were telling Vyasadev's um, story, I was asking mom, do you know how Vyasadev Ji was born? She started telling me story of Vyasadev Ji dictating the uh, Gita to Ganesh Ji. But I thought Gan um, Gita is much more difficult than Bhagavatam. So I would have thought Gita to be postgraduate and Bhagavatam uh, is something to ease us into Gita because I think Gita is so much more complicated. Am I wrong, Prabhuji? Um, it's it's a very good point, actually. I, I don't know if anybody else on the call actually has the official answer to this. Okay. I don't know if Ariko in the Prabhu or Prahad Prabhu, anyone? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yeah. Um... I think as far as my understanding goes, uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita teaches all the basic things about uh, the soul and the super soul and, uh, you know, just uh, the basics of spirituality of who we are and then what we're supposed to do and then uh, what is the material world and what is the nature. So, but uh, Bhagavatam is, you know, more, more or less uh, the, the activities of the Lord and the, the devotees. So that, uh, that is, uh, I mean, also mentions that you know this is this is a postgraduate study 
so it has it has in i mean it is also containing the mahabharat uh, past times also but but still uh, propad also calls it as prose credit study correct krishna this and prabhu ji could it be because um, bhagavatam was um, to glorify god and you've got to have a sense of understanding of krishna the whole ourselves before we can understand real krishna in his true self i suppose you've got to be slightly more mature could that be the reason i don't know um, yeah so that that's the other point that i was going to make right i just wanted to check if there was an official answer um because we are told right bhagavad gita is the undergrad shama bhagavatam is the graduate and then chaitanya charitamrita is the postgrad but if we look at the progression there bhagavad gita is the are the instructions of god what is the final instruction surrender unto me right because he's krishna shama bhagavatam then goes on to describe the activities of god but if we don't have a concept of who god is and what our relationship with god is as ari gondi prabhu was mentioning which comes from the gita then we'll just see the bhagavatam as, as stories right often times at least those who are born in indian families who whose parents aren't like um proper devotees in some sense they'll be they'll grow up in that culture and they'll just see it as stories often times at least i did and then when we when you look at chaitanya charitamrita we get to the heart of god right god's mood god's sort of feelings the devotional aspect of our relationship with god so that progression is also there so yes whilst shama bhagavatam is easier to read in one sense because it's stories as you said right sandhya mata ji but in order for us to develop the appreciation and understanding of krishna as god it doesn't really do much for us because we can very easily misunderstand it and misinterpret it as just pastimes as just stories thank you prabhu ji hari krishna yeah Hare Krishna are there any other questions or comments Hare Krishna you can sabhi nash prabhuji Hare Krishna I just wanted to um, uh, just talking about this uh, three sandhyam you know paying obeisances um, three times and uh, so on uh, I know I'm I'm guilty sometimes I do you know but when i go to temple i always try to pay obeisances even if i have a meeting or something like that don't so it so happens the morning we always do pay obeisances but i just thinking about about uh, haridas thakur actually uh, he never got a chance to go to the temple but he was seeing the temple from far away and uh, the key for him was chanting the hari naam throughout the day so i was just my question is the priority uh obeisances or should it be we remember krishna 24 hours a day rather than three times a day uh where people you to ritualistic do 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 these prayers the, the key thing is to 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 be krishna conscious 24 hours a day uh and chant like haridas thakur did so i just my question is the priority where does this take priority which one takes priority over the other you know that's a that's a very nice question actually so i i will just start by clarifying it's not three times a day it's at least three times a day yeah so there's always room for two more <laughs> um okay so it, this actually reminds me of a past time of shurupad where a disciple had actually gone to shurupad right like Sure, Papa. I don't feel like paying paying obeisances to you. I don't feel like paying obeisances to the deity, right? So what should I do? Because my heart's not in it. But Sure, Papa instructed him that actually, you pay the obeisances anyway, because by paying the obeisances, one day you'll actually have that genuine feeling, that appreciation, and that desire to actually pay your obeisances. So then it comes to what you mentioned, right, of Nash Prabhu around. Okay. what's the priority is it remembering krishna 24/7 or is it trying to pay obeisances ritualistically at our stage you know how if we actually are honest with ourselves are we honestly saying that we are actually krishna conscious 24/7 you know 
I myself know I'm not, you know, there'll be many times throughout the day where I'm thinking, okay, Kirtan's on in the background whilst I'm working, etc. But my consciousness just goes into my work as the primary thing. And sometimes if I'm on meetings, I might be like, oh, this is such a drag, you know, this meeting's so like boring. I might decide, okay, you know, what should I do? I can try and chant him under my breath or something. But I'm consciously listening to the conversation. If somebody says something and I get annoyed, then like the chanting goes out the window, you know? So we have to be honest with ourselves. Like, are we really Krishna conscious 24 seven? And if we're not, then yes, that ritualistic, as we call it, element to paying obeisances is good because what we're doing there is we're putting our head at the feet of our spiritual master. And that is, although ritualistic, it's saying that, you know, our spiritual master, we're giving them the higher position so that their mercy can come to us so that we can remember Krishna 24 seven. And I don't remember um, the personality, I don't know if somebody else on the call can help, but I believe it's from Chaitanya Charitamrita or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes, where there's a personality that chants um, like lakhs of names, but he also makes a point to have like thousands of obeisances to the deities and thousands of obeisances to Vaishnavas daily. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers the details with the personality. Um, but you can see even great personalities, they give a lot of prioritization to pay obeisances. So it probably didn't answer the question, Prabhu, but um, hopefully no, thanks, it helps. Thanks, Prabhu. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's quite a good answer, actually. That's, that's what um, we need to do both in parallel because we need the mercy of the Guru um, by paying obeisances because Guru can go a long way in giving us mercy, then we can chant the names of the Lord properly. And um, yeah, uh, I'm just, um, I was curious when I was thinking about Harida Thakur's pastime here, um, that he was constantly chanting. And probably we should be, we should be thinking of Krishna 24 hours, but to, we don't, you're right. We don't think of Krishna 24 hours a day, but we should probably, I mean, for, for me personally, whenever I get time, I probably, if I am, I am, I am, I'm, I haven't got nothing to do, I just think, oh, let me put my hand in a big bag and start chanting. So that's something, you know, uh, I was just thinking that we must do that, you know, while we, are, we have got nothing to do, uh, because at least you are remembering Krishna that way. Yeah, the other thing with Haridas Thakur is that it wasn't that he was just chanting 24-7. He was relishing the chanting 24-7. That's right. And, and, and I think that's, that word itself makes a big difference to comparing our <laughs> chanting to his, right? Very, very true, very true. Yes. Hare Krishna. Um, and that reminds me of Radhakanta Prabhuji. He mentioned that Mother Kulangna would pay obeisances to, to every devotee she would see. She was constantly paying obeisances to them. Okay, Arya Govinda Astrovaji, kindly. Uh, uh, there, there is a Babaji in uh, Vrindavan, and uh, he pays, uh, he does the Dandavat Parikrama to the Govardhan. So that means every step he pays the Dandavat Parikrama and he moves, moves ahead. So, you know, his, his whole, whole uh, activity for the whole life is just doing Dandavat Parikrama to uh, Govardhan. And if we're talking the same personality, I think he does 108 at each step, right? Yes, 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 yes. 108, 108 times. To he had a he has a Govardhan Shila. He does 108 times and then go moves ahead. And then he eats uh, prasadam in uh, in uh, in one of the temples in Vrindavan. And then his only job is to, I mean, his only life is to do Dandavat Parikram. Yeah. You know, physically, you, we can't even imagine how it could be. And we get tired just going around doing one parikrama. <laughs> and our bodies are healthier. <laughs> Babaji is, I don't know how old Babaji is, but <laughs> the record is quite old as well. So, just... Hare Krishna, we, are, uh, we have exhausted our time, but um, uh, I'd like to introduce, okay, Panchali Mataji has a question, but I wanted to even introduce Path Prabhuji, who's our mentor uh, at ISKCON Eldoret. And I think he hasn't met uh, Brijesh Prabhuji. Um, 
uh, it's okay, uh, Matuji, uh, you can introduce uh, Bart Privilege because um, what I was going to say is a, a comment and I'm not even sure if I'm correct. Um, I would have been speculating. Might as well make the comment, Bart Privilege is there. So, <laughs> um, yes, but, uh, do, cor do correct me, uh, Prabhuji, uh, Bridesh Prabhu, or any other Prabhuji's or Matuji's on the call. Um, so as, as you were teaching, and it's really my bad, I should take more proper notes. Um, as you were teaching, Prabhuji, I was trying to remember um, what I had from one of the other classes about uh, that calculation of um, uh, the yugas and as to when Krishna comes. So uh, do correct me if I'm wrong, but um, from what I remember from that class is, uh, you know, you have the four yugas, so Satya, uh, Dwapa, Treta, Kali Yuga. So these four make one Chatu Yuga. Now, 71 times of these Chatu Yugas make one Manmantara. And there are in one day of Brahma, there are 14 of these manmantaras. Am I right? Okay. okay, so now we come to when does Krishna come? So out of these 14 manmantaras in one day of Brahma, in, in the time of the seventh manmantara, and remember in each manmantara, there are 71 chaturyugas. So the seventh man mantras, 28 chaturyuk towards the end of the 28 chaturyuk of the seventh man mantra is when the Dwapa yuk um, uh, uh, comes after the Treta yuk, and that's when Lord Krishna comes as himself. But I am not sure if I remember this correctly or not. So if I'm wrong, please do correct me. So I was very, I was very reluctant to make this comment, but um, I was trying to remember and it's, it's, so, it's completely my bad. I really, really should remember all the information that I learned from the, from the Gurujis and Prabhujis in the classes. But yeah, I just thought I'll, I'll bring it up. And it was also a nice way for me to, to remind me to remember the lessons better. No, that's uh, amazing if you if that's from recollection, you know, Mataji. Um, but in terms of the calculations, as far as I followed, that's correct. The only thing is with regards to Krishna's original appearance, I've never heard that it's like fixed before, but I've I've never heard against that either. So I don't know if anybody else has. I'll try to be wrong in that case, Prabhuji. I've, I've just I never come across it, so it, you may be, well be correct. I just don't know. Um, I don't know, I'll, I'll find out, but you might be able to advise me better next, yeah, next time. Sorry about that, <laughs> apologies, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, I mean, I can't even remember so much, so I'm keeping it very simple. Uh, but my husband was telling me about it, and I said, okay, 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 but I, I, it's too complex for me, all these calculations, I wasn't good at maths. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I this is... I, would like Path Prabhuji, if you are there, Prabhuji, if you can switch on your video. Rajesh Prabhuji, Path Prabhuji is our mentor, and he uh, we are here because of him. He is Iskon Eldoret's uh, temple president, and he runs the show. We are just uh, following his footsteps. He was in India uh, for some time, so hence he had not joined the group, but he's always there. And um, I just would like you to meet him and Prabhuji. Patroji, I'd like you to end the session as well after giving your comments. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, uh, Brajis Prabhuji. You are giving very nice, wonderful class. Also, the past time of Vyasadev, uh, the incarnation of Ajay, like you told, the Satyabesha Avatar, the Krishna himself, he come, uh, the uh, form of uh, Vyasadev to write down all the scriptures because he knows in the age of a Kali, the people memories are too late. They cannot even remember what is happened in the last day. So it is most necessary for that reason Krishna himself come and he wrote everything. So his first name was Krishna Daipyana, but when he wrote everything, an explanation, which is called name is Vyasa in Vistar, in a very explanational way. It's very nice, you told. And also the three Sandhya, you told how 
sometimes krishna come and according his will this uh, like the even yuga also change like satya dwapar trata when it change satya trata dwapar kali it is krishna also himself he can do this one stuff so, just close so it is very nice you are giving the instruction because uh, if when you are reading the bhagavat and all the scriptures we supposed to be know who is the author uh, of the scriptures and what is this is the background what is the glories of this one so that we have a more interest that is the thank you very much prabhu ji for your nice class also very explanation way you are giving this one also panchali mata ji asking about the about the uh, millennium 28th millennium of the seventh manantra that is right krishna not appeared in all dwapar yuga in the seventh manu he appeared and after that immediately chaitanya mahaprabhu came otherwise no chaitanya mahaprabhu came all dwapar yuga or all kali yuga also chaitanya mahaprabhu not came so we are so fortunate that we are in this millennium yeah in this millennium uh, chaitanya uh, also krishna came in the dwapar yuga and after that also chetan mahaprabhu came so it is very very golden and we are so fortunate that we have getting that one the nectar so also we are also so fortunate so we are in joy in iskon and getting the guru parampara and everything that is also thank you very much panchali mataji is telling it is very right also you mentioned about the other things like tri sandhya uh like haridas thakur he have doing 22 hours 23 hours a day so he have no time to do in this sandhya also another example i'm giving the swana madhavendra puri who is the chaitanya mahaprabhu guru chaitanya mahaprabhu guru guru ishwar puri and guru is madhavendra puri who came from vrindavan to puri to bring the sandalwood it may be no chandan yatra start now the chandan yatra start for 21 days because in india this is too hard so the priest of the all the temple they are doing uh, the putting the uh, sandal wood pulp to the god because it giving the cooling now this that day there is no st or any other thing so that that is the way they are giving so madhavendra puri by his effort madhavendra puri is a world as he came also he prayed in his prayers i am sorry because when i chanting the transcendental name of krishna i forget everything and please the four father the tri sandhya i am not offer my obeisances to you because he is so so entangled and so like he is like he he forget everything except name so there is no question he is not doing the tri sandhya that is no any offense or that one but how did it happen like prabhu ji mentioned hardas thakur or madhavendra puri they are in the exhausted stage they are in a transcendental stage we cannot compare or we cannot imitate that one just we can do but what is our guru or what is our mentor told we have just the parallel line like a, like a rail there is two lines without one line we cannot drive the train so our sadhana it means tri sandhya japa association reading tunes everything is there also another thing also the chanting or what to devotional services there we are supposed to do this same thing so that we can increase our faith increase our interest and we can understand better the uh, scripture and it is coming to we can realize that one and when we are then task that stage in haridas level or in madhavendra puri level then there is no need to doing so many formalities automatically you will do that one like just now to told uh, my guru told i am a fool i cannot read the vedanta because i am a fool he just instruct you just chant the holy name then when i chant the holy name i become faint i dance i fell down so that one so god himself he is so that is so that is the another stage but uh, in our preliminary stage we supposed to be do all the formality so to giving us interest and uh, we supposed to better uh, do that one hare krishna thank you very much prabhu ji for your wonderful class also thanks all the devotees here and uh, we are so grateful to be the part of this uh, um, bhagavad gita session bhagavad gita and bhagavatam session I request all the devotees, please unmute yourself and chant Hare Krishna mantra for glorification of His Grace, Rajesh Prabhuji. Please join.
हरे 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 श्रील प्रभुपाद प्रभु की जय हरे कृष्णा